1995's Ravenloft Stone Prophet was the second of three Ravenloft games to have ever existed. It was created by Strategic Simulations as a direct sequel to Ravenloft Strahd's Possession, which I covered in my last upload. These games were true dungeon crawler FPSs, and were quite well received at the time, though almost entirely forgotten about in modern gaming culture. The engine used for these games was also used to create a sister game surrounding Drizzt and the Underdark, called Menzobar... M Menzobar... Uh, we're just gonna call the game Menzies, that that's what we're calling it. <laughs> My audience is 95% male. That joke uh, might be a bit of a deep cut. Where Strahd's Possession roughly followed the original 1983 Ravenloft module, being concerned with the vampiric Lord Strahd in the domain of Barovia, Stone Prophet instead is based off of the dark domain of Harakir, and the vengeful mummy Anktapot. And here's the thing. In the modern day, I think we've mostly given up on Egyptian tombs as a horror setting in favor of letting it be more of an action-adventure kind of thing. But Stone Prophet makes a go at making this setting into a proper horror game. And I'll be honest, it kind of nails it at times. The first game wasn't remotely scary. It, I mean, it was just kind of gothic. Stone Prophet legitimately spooked me at times, though. For this reason and others, most discussions I've found on this series regard Stone Prophet to be the better of the two games. It's been greatly fleshed out with new features, spells, and gameplay mechanics added. We'll get into if that's really true as the video goes on, but for now, I'll let you know that we actually passed the goal for the Strahd video, which means that my next video is going to cover the intensely bad third Ravenloft game, which was a PS1 fighting game for some reason. I've already logged a playtest session on the Crow's Perch stream. It's a very bad game. Oh my god, I can't fucking handle the bone zone. <laughs> no one it's can handle strong. the bone zone. Yo, get bone! <laughs> the trash the talk. Point is, subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to join me on seeing this little Ravenloft trilogy through to the end. And also, if you want to support the channel, the best way to help me get these videos out there is to hit the like button. I'm really grateful that you've all been here to hang out and watch while I explore various tabletop-related video games. It's been incredibly fun, and the channel has grown a lot recently. So to all the new folks who've been signing on, let me just say, hey, welcome to the cool side of the pillow. Okay, enough warbling on. Stone Prophet is based off of an old 1991 D&D module called Touch of Death which is much more obscure than anything related to the more iconic Strahd von Sarovich. So then, what's Harakir, who is Anktapot, and why is the narrative of this game so nightmare-inducing? Let's start from the beginning. Before that morning, no one in El Terrell knew of the land called Harakir. By signal, by whisper, and by hurried order, the word travels. It reaches the bravest in the land, those bold adventurers who, once more, are called to serve good Lord Delt. With this being a direct sequel of Strahd's Possession, we are once again playing as Hellriders from the realm of Elturel. And much like the first game, we're getting isekai'd into a dark realm. I didn't pay El Torel too much attention in my first video, but I have now noticed something amazing since then. The Hell Riders of El Torel are so named because one of them was once isekai'd into Avernus, aka Hell. Which means that with both Ravenloft games having Servants of Lord Delt getting whisked away to Ravenloft, the Hell Riders 
kind of just seem to fall into portals constantly. And what's even better is that the modern 5e module, Descent into Avernus, actually involves literally the entire city getting isekai'd into hell. Citizens of El Torel may legitimately be the only demographic who gets transported to fantasy worlds more than Japanese neats. It's just, it's just an entire society that can't stop falling into portals. Uh, anyway, we have the option to import our characters from the first game, but I chose to create a brand new party. You may recall from the first video that I was getting my ass kicked as I was learning the controls of these games. As I was struggling in those early sections, I allowed myself to get suckered in by a bunch of min-maxers on the forums who led me to believe that this was a min-max or die kind of game. It is not that sort of game. The difficulty of these games is, in my opinion, greatly overblown. Once you know the controls, the difficulty is incredibly fair. So with that in mind, I chose to start a new party where I could be a bit more free with the choices I made. Not to mention that I just wanted to try other things. So I let my poor old characters kick the habit, and I created a brand new isekai support group to relapse their way back into Ravenloft. They can stop anytime they want, I'm sure. We still have the tarot card character creation system, which I absolutely adore. I mean, come on, look at my channel art. This time, we also have a fortune teller narrating our choices. A gnome comes to Harikin. And you've been gnomed. It shows that the designers were actively trying to improve even the little things in each iteration. I put together a fighter cleric and a pure mage. I then crossed the threshold into an unfamiliar desert. Rather than being swarmed by wargs off the hop like last time, we are instead greeted by a horrible sight. You... You are not... villagers. Descent... grass... trees... You come from outside this place. Go back. There is no place for you in Harakir. To the north, east, the village, Muhar, Teve, my fault, Piotr. I brought us here. Forgive me, my brother. A poor legacy for Piotr. I imagine that this cutscene was completely chilling in 1995, and even now, I found this to be a really great way to start our adventure. It's especially great if you played the first game. The Vistani in Barovia freely roam the mists. It's a cursed realm for all but they, as they have the power to come and go as they please. And yet, here we walk into Harakir, and suddenly a Vistani, who are all kind of just having fun in the last game, are suddenly as terrified as everyone else is. Maybe even more so. This was never supposed to be something that happened to them. This is a very potent shakeup of the rules as we know them. This cryptic storytelling continues for quite a while, and it's something that's really to this game's credit. Shocking scenes keep happening, and we have neither control nor understanding. For the first third of this game, we'll only be receiving trickles of knowledge about strange gods, horrible curses, and how great ancients damned Harakir to this fate. We've walked into a land of cursed sands and scorching sun that doesn't give a damn about us, and we're left to find our own way home. The only hint we have to go on is that we're supposed to go north. But beyond that, it's entirely up to us to make sense of this place and to set goals for ourselves. Now, Strahd's Possession was approaching being an open world game, but Stone Prophet goes the rest of the way. This is a 1995 open world RPG, albeit with a somewhat barren world. Right behind us is what we'll come to learn is the Wall of Ra. Trying to leave Harakir will cause you to be burned to a crisp which is Ra's last effort to assure that Harakir is not only a land of the dead. With nothing to go off of and a giant desert stretching forth beneath our feet, I knew it was time to explore. So I put on one of my favorite podcasts in the background and I started mapping out the desert. I can't believe how um, mature and cool I thought I was at 12. Um, I was cool, but you know what I mean. 
so true, Paris. Pretty much right away, I realized that this game has a survival mechanic, in that you have thirst meters that you're gonna need to manage. There are scattered water skins everywhere that you need to collect and ration out. You're always going to be on the clock to finish whatever segment you're on before you run out of water. Or, 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 you can, you can just cast the first level spell, create water every morning, and the mechanic no longer exists. I'm, I'm 90% sure that the create water spell is, is just pee. As cool as it is that we've got a survival mechanic, which I think means you could arguably call this a survival horror game, it's kinda lame that the mechanic is completely trivialized by a first level spell. Sure glad that we've learned better since then, and that we don't have the problem of trivializing survival mechanics in D&D 5e using first level spells and cantrips. Right guys? Guys, the first landmark we stumble across is a small tent with another horrific scene before us. An old woman struggles to communicate. Her tongue and her eyes have been carved out. And then, my dumbass player characters tell each other how surprised they are that the blind woman can hear them. Holy shit, my party was a lot less stupid than the first game. Although she can't speak, she hastily draws a map in the sand for us to follow, bidding us to go east and look for a well. I accidentally overshoot this, and I stumble into my first enemies. Rising from the dunes in front of a lost temple, a horde of desert zombies screech and attack. And I will admit, this was goddamn scary. <laughs> The two NPCs managed to creep me out, and now we've got this. Okay, these guys aren't scary to look at, I admit, but the visuals are not what's making this work. It's the sound effects. A lot of the enemies in this game have some of the most terrifying battle cries I've heard in video games. They remind me a lot of the crows from Bloodborne. So when zombies start rising from the sand, you hear their screams long before you see them. The sound team outdid themselves on this game. Truly incredible work. After realizing that I had no hope of fighting this swarm of the dead, I backtrack a ways and I find my first companion. His name is Trajan Ket, and he too has been transported here against his will. The locals tend to hate isekai protagonists, and I mean, who can blame them? So Ket has been wandering the desert alone for years as a wandering ranger cleric, searching for a way home. Now, last time the min-maxers convinced me to forego companions in favor of stacking my XP in fewer characters. Now that I have learned better, I figure I could probably use a ranger, so Ket comes along with me as my number three. Soon, we come across the well the blind woman sent us looking for, and we make an interesting discovery. There in the sand is a teleportation stone to the village of Muhar, along with a note letting you know that there are other transportation stones to various locations that will be scattered around the world. You know what I hate, fellas? I hate these damn modern games with their fast travel mechanics. Back in my day, we had to fast travel everywhere. We climb down the well and learn that there's an entire Egyptian tomb down here devoted to an ancient woman named Neferti. Trapped in the well is a more modern local woman who fell down here to escape a sandstorm. She wants our help to escort her back to Muhar. I'm cool with it, but I don't really want to leave the temple yet until I've found the fast travel stone. We head down the hall to check out the monster she says she heard down the hallway, and I was curious what manner of creatures I would be fighting down here. Mummies, skeletons, jackals. <laughs> Fire-breathing frogs, yeah, definitely that was my next guess. It's not long before we find the teleport stone down here, so I grab the poor villager and we teleport to Muhar. It's a very run-down place, probably even more so than Barovia was. And just like Ket told me, the villagers did not take kindly to outsiders. They've been tormented by storms and more recently by a vicious plague that's ripped through the village. We're working with the barest scraps of information and somehow the villagers know even less than we do. 
All anyone knows is that all of these misfortunes are the will of the pharaoh, Ankhdepot, though no one knows why. The closest thing they have to a working theory is that this is all caused by our arrival. Papa, Mama, please make the strangers go away. Make the sickness go away. Make it go away. Make it go away. It's useless to argue that the plague started before we got here, however. All but a handful of them have agreed to stonewall us as a collective. We grab a few side quests that aren't worth mentioning, and I pick a tent on the outskirts to use for storage. I also meet Pyotr, the brother of the dying woman we met when we first arrived, and he tells us that our initial understanding was pretty much correct. A band of Vistani were trapped in this realm, dying one by one of the plague, and gripped with the terror of losing the freedom that makes them who they are. Pyotr is determined to leave, and he agrees to join my party. With the village being so hostile, there's not much more to be done, so it's time to head back to the well. Returning to the Temple of Nefertiti, I'm struck with just how many improvements have been made to the dungeon crawling compared to the first game. There are a lot of little tweaks to the UI and controls, but most of them aren't worth talking about. But I will say that I really like that they made the quick save and quick load into clickable UI elements. In Strahd's possession, they were just hotkeys, and since they didn't have any sound effect or any other kind of feedback to confirm that the quick save actually worked, it made me just a little bit too paranoid to actually use them. The big changes, however, aren't so much changes as they are the fact that it's clear that the design team has learned the insides and outs of their engine. Things are more challenging, but not unfairly so. I still wouldn't consider anything in this game to be hard. The mechanics are just a bit more varied. As has already been hinted with the fireball frogs, enemy variety is also significantly more than the last game, and the encounters are much more imaginative. And it's not like that was a problem for the first game either. I already thought that this was a high point of the first game. We've gone from a gold star to, to two gold stars. Congrats, good job, wow. wow. The puzzles are much better too, which is extremely welcome. There are still hidden doors and switches that can be a bit obnoxious to find, but I mean, hey, it's still a 90s game. Mostly these are telegraphed in ways that make them pretty fair. Plus, the fact that I had a dwarf and an elf in my party gave me notifications every time I was near a hidden wall. We're in the era now where designers have started to realize that hidden wall mechanics are horrible, but they're still trying to salvage them. In a few years, they'll either scrap them entirely or reduce them to just kind of an Easter egg thing, but for now, at least some effort has been put into making it tolerable. There was one element that I found to be a downgrade mechanically though. The devs seem to have wanted to improve the clarity of the turn order, so they've added a hit stop animation whenever one of your characters attack. And I hate it. It's unnaturally long, it slows things down, and it ruins the flow of combat. It also makes my footage look like ass. I can't believe these 1995 bastards would be so inconsiderate to YouTubers. The map, on the other hand, has been unquestionably improved, with certain things being labeled with symbols that never were before. Yet, even so, this is still a game of dungeon cartography. So the Shrine of Nefertiti is still a quest to fill out and annotate the map. As we explore, we learn that Nefertiti was a woman the gods had a crush on, and when she went blind, the gods then gifted her with a pair of magical replacements, which we will find in this dungeon during our explorations. This certainly explains why the blind woman wanted us to come here. At the bottom of the pit, we also discover a helm of telepathy, so now the whole no tongue problem has also been solved. Thus, the first dungeon has been completed, and we may return to our quest giver. Her eyesight now returned, and now able to speak directly into people's brains, she introduces herself to us as Mindir, and says that she will reward us by leading the gang to an obelisk where our fates will be revealed. Which, life hack, if you're an uninsured American, you too can pay for it by leading your healthcare providers to ancient obelisks. Neat! We have to take Mindir with us, so I dismiss Pyotr, and, I mean, he's not happy about it. A curse upon you for leaving me behind. 
May the sun burn your eyes and vultures pluck them out. Hey, you know what? Fuck you, buddy. I was gonna take you back after I finished up with Mindir. Not anymore. Congrats, dickhead. You played yourself. Unfortunately, when Mindir said she would take us to an obelisk, what she actually meant is that she would hang out with us as we wander the desert eternally until eventually we stumble across it. I later learned that there was a kid in Muhar who would have given me a map to where all the dungeons were, uh, but I completely missed that until later in the game. I instead wander into the only other dungeon that I do know about, the snake-filled Temple of Set that has been cursed by a noble family during the decline of Harakir in ages past. It's a complete nightmare to get through, and I'm desperately hoping to find containers. I do not find containers. Like in the first game, Stone Prophet has some complicated inventory management in which you need to take the loot chests with you to carry your stuff around. And thus far, I'd barely found any of these containers whatsoever, so I was starting to get a little bit desperate. In time, I do come to accept that this place is just too high level for me, and I continue on my desert wanderings. The obelisk is eventually uncovered, and a green ghost guy greets me. He's been guarding this place for thousands of years waiting for us to come here and read this big slab next to him. Hey, sorry guy, I got here as fast as I could. Civilization needed to form on my plane and eventually give birth to my party. It took a bit. He calls this hieroglyphic wall the Stone Prophet. Oh my god, that's the name of the- He tells us that everything we're gonna need to understand the Stone Prophet is down below across three levels of underground labyrinth. Anyway, because he was kind enough to warn us of the impending mega dungeon, I head off to grab a fourth party member now that Mindir has left us. Near the entrance, I had found a possible companion, so I loop back to take a second look. This guy is a bizarre lion centaur thing named Hrok Tour, and let me tell you boys, he's way too alpha to hang out with the villagers. In Muhar, the frightened huddled in whatever shadows they might find. In fact, he's beyond being an alpha male. He's beyond even being a sigma male. He's a, he's a, a, a he's a Wemmick male. Hrok Tour is yet another recovering isekai protagonist, so I let him join our support group. He has lost his Wemmick armor and can't wear human gear, but fortunately, even though he will be naked for some time, I can still compensate with cleric spells. I like to imagine that he lets Trajan Ket give him little head scratchies in exchange. Stone Prophet is actually flush with these inhuman companions, and it's quite cool to see. I play around briefly with one of the other ones later, but there's also a desert troll and a werejackal that I didn't recruit recruit? Lots of options. With the support group assembled, I head back to the obelisk to find what I needed in order to understand the Stone Prophet. So, what's in the dungeon? Well, containers, thankfully. Uh, but more importantly, there's also an actual real-life prophecy. They knew! Six years before the Mummy 2, they predicted it! This is a bit of a difficulty ramp, and I'd imagine that the game was trying to teach me lessons about remembering to use my spells. Uh, fortunately, I played the first game, and so I didn't need any more lessons. And because melee combat against these guys is basically being on the wrong end of a blender, I take advantage of some of the new spells. Eventually, we grab all the fragments of the translation document, and I spend two goddamn hours of real-world time translating this prophecy. But see, here is where the game gets a lot worse in my opinion. Up until now, it's been unambiguously better than Strahd's Possession. And honestly, the biggest reason for that has been the storytelling. All these techniques that they've been employing have been fantastic, and they've been supplying me with kind of on and off horror this whole time. Ultimately, everything so far has created just this intoxicating atmosphere. The opaque plot and the out of your depth narrative has just been such a strength. But now, now we have a prophecy in hand and the game kind of just stops having a narrative altogether. We've essentially just been handed a grocery list of tasks to accomplish and the devs the devs just stop creating narrative beats to have us moving between locations. The first 10 hours of Stone Prophet is a staggeringly effective dark fantasy horror game. The remaining 20 or so hours are you just wandering around trying to complete your artifact shopping list. And it just, it feels like such an abrupt drop in atmosphere. I mean, 
it's true that there's still the fact that we can piece together kind of a narrative about how Harakir got this way, but in my opinion, that's kind of the Fallout 76 launch problem again. I don't want to hear about a cool story that happened a long time ago. I want to be in a cool story. Anyway, from here on, the Isekai support group's goal is to gather the fragments of two seals that are each in four pieces. We kick sand on our journey back to the Temple of Set. Now that we're actually supposed to be here, there's an NPC for us to interact with. To explain who this person is, I gotta explain some of the lore we've been finding in notes across Harakir. What we do know about Octopot is that he was the pharaoh of Harakir and led the place to great heights of civilization in ages past. He was the chosen of Ra, and a much beloved leader of his people. But somehow, things went wrong, and with the decline of both the pharaoh and the lands, the mists stole the desert away to become yet another dark realm of Ravenloft. Octopot's touch of death at some point created the greater mummy Senmet, who was eventually stolen away from him by the evil priestess of Set, Isu, and subsequently Senmet was used by Isu as a pawn against the pharaoh. And here in the entrance of the Temple of Set is the still alive priestess Isu, who insists that Senmet is totally and definitely dead. He's 100% not alive somewhere, not the basement, he's definitely not alive in the basement, do not check the basement. Frankly, I trust her. Anyway, we get dungeon diving. I cleared a lot of it out the first time I came here, but this time we discover our most persistent allies on this quest, wall vaginas. That's right, folks. When shit goes wrong and you need advice, you can always trust wussy. They will be scattered around in various dungeons from now on, and they'll provide help, advice, tips, or sometimes just let you know that other wall vaginas are the ones who actually have advice for you. Anyway, the Greater Mummy Senmet is in the dungeon because, I mean, of course he is. And he's a Greater Mummy, so he just keeps coming back to life every time I kill him. Fortunately, we can't ignore him from now, and we just pick up the seal fragments we need, as well as a watering can and a Helm of True Sight. The Helm of True Sight was amazing to have. My big complaint about the first game was that sometimes the hidden wall puzzles were unfun. That was true of this game as well. But not anymore. We're now actually free of the worst mechanic in 90s dungeon crawling. The watering can is also a big deal, I guess. In our prophesized grocery list, we know that we can use it at the Temple of Harvest, which I actually did stumble across earlier during my search for the obelisk. But before we head out, my thoughts on the visuals of this game fully solidified here, and they're worth mentioning now. Much like the first game, the art team did an excellent job. Every individual dungeon looks great, and the character work is exemplary. And just like the first game, the UI will change in different locations. On paper, this is all as good or better than Strahd's possession. After all, I mean, your eyeballs aren't going to be melting in Stone Prophet as you wander a slime cave for three hours. But there is something missing here, and I actually don't think it was the fault of the art team. They did a fantastic job of making all the dungeons look different, and I love what they did with the Temple of Set. But at the end of the day, there's only so much they can do when every single dungeon is an Egyptian tomb. And it doesn't really matter if this one's a purple and green tomb and that one's a golden tomb or how much they change up the brickwork. Spending the entire 30 hour playthrough in tombs just, I mean, it just blends together. You don't even notice when the UI changes because it's, I mean, it's just tone slabs. The art team did their best, but they couldn't save this because the designers chose to make everything a tomb. And I know, I know, it's ancient Egypt themed, but that doesn't mean that it had to be like this. Give me a gemstone laden cavern. Give me a temple in an oasis that's completely overrun by venomous plants. Or hell, give me a ruined outdoor city dungeon along the lines of Zulfarak from World of Warcraft. And as if to contradict me, the moment I had thought this, I arrived at the Temple of Harvest, and it's a ruined outdoor city like Zulfarak, as though they had read my mind. And then the game even took a victory lap, because once I reached the center, I handed over the watering can and the priest restored all the greenery in the temple too. Amazing, I thought. Incredible, I thought. I was clearly wrong to have doubted the devs. And then the priest told me, says, hey, did you know that underneath this temple, there's actually a tomb? We were doing so well. So you might hope that this basement would be mostly plants and water, since, I mean, we just did a magic ritual to fill the area with plants and water. But 
you would be wrong. Although the game gave me a brief respite for the upper level, we're going back to Ancient Tombs. And sadly, that upper level was the only dungeon in the entire game that isn't some form of tomb. And it's such a problem because everything blends together and stretches out endlessly. It even affects the music. Now, much like with Strahd's Possession, the music theming in this game kind of just keeps one hand on the central premise, you know, the kind of Egyptian sound, or in Strahd's Possession it was kind of that gothic vibe, but it varies how much it's going to be loyal to that, and it often just veers into synth. Which is welcome, but even that, again, it just couldn't save the fact that everything's a tomb. Re-listening to the music after playing the game, it's all quite varied, but during my playthrough, God did it ever blend together. Now look, the thing with these old dungeon crawlers is that they only work if you're enjoying crawling through these dungeons. You have to be happy to be in these dungeons. I loved every single dungeon in Strahd's possession, even the ugly ones, because, I mean, they were all distinct and unique from one another. And if there were frustrating parts, and there were frustrating parts, it was okay because I wasn't bored of the location I was in yet. What I'm saying is that none of the visual aesthetics had overstayed their welcome. But that's, that, that's just not true in Stone Prophet. There's even less downtime between dungeons than in Strahd's Possession, and the entire game is just the same kind of brick wall tiles over and over, no matter how good a job the art team did at switching up the brickwork and the colors. So, Frustrated and angry in the temple basement, I, I did the only thing I could to get myself through yet another brick tomb. I hunkered down, turned on one of my favorite podcasts, and I pressed on. I'm just one of those people I think that people project a lot onto me. So. They're, they're jealous. Gwyneth, Gwyneth, they're just jealous. They're just jealous. There's not a ton to talk about down here, but we did find a statue who really wanted to see the sun. The stone grocery list tells me that Roz Coffer can capture the sun, and I found it somewhere during my excursions. I show it to the statue, and much like my pasty ass, he fucking explodes the second he's exposed to the sun. And we find within a seal fragment. Next up, we travel far to the north to do some troll hunting. The burial catacomb up here is one of the cooler dungeon entrances I've ever seen, because it's not just a skull entrance, entrance, it's three different entrances, and you have to use a jump or levitate spell in order to enter each of the eyes. You have to complete the two eye mini dungeons before you get all of the assets you need to get you through the mouth dungeon. Ultimately, we gather up more seal fragments, grab some items for fulfilling stone profit objectives, and we meet a very interesting companion. You see, my support group is not the first one to go tomb diving in Harakir, and long ago, another group tried and failed to to kill the mummy Senmet. Almost all of them were killed in battle, including a paladin, Gloriantha, who has now risen in undeath and has been wandering the catacombs ever since. She's an undead paladin and she's cool as shit, and she says she needs to kill Senmet in order to be free. Now, since last time we fought the ever-reviving Greater Mummy, I found something called a Special Scroll of Retirement. I knew from the first game that the Special Scrolls were plot relevant, and I had a hunch that I could use it on Senmet. Met. I bring Gloriantha with me to slay the mummy, and it goes very well. He's dead, and so my undead bestie is free. And then I get this, I get this nagging little thought in my head. Wasn't, what, what, wasn't Isu planning on using this guy to kill Onktapot? Onktapot, who is supposed to be even more unkillable than Senmet? Did I just, fuck. Hoping that I didn't just destroy the only pharaoh killing weapon in all of Harakir, I put it out of my mind, and I head to the next dungeon. This is Egyptian fantasy, so naturally you knew we were going to enter a sphinx at some point, and that point is now. This dungeon actually stumped me really hard. I had cleared out as much as I could, and no matter how many times I asked the wussy to help me, none of them were able to help me figure out what was blocking me. 
And then, then I misclicked on something. Oh my god, the pots in this dungeon break if you right-click them. Okay, I, I'm not gonna lie. Nothing has been breakable in either one of these games until now. So, this... This was a bit of an unfair thing for me to need to figure out, not gonna lie. But regardless, we get through, and we find even more seal fragments. But we also learn a little bit more about Ankhtapot, and some of the key figures in the downfall of Harakir. Ankh was a good pharaoh, a great one even. Best of the best, you could say. Chosen of Ra, etc, etc. But, I mean, all good things have to come to an end. Ankhtapot was reaching the end of his natural lifespan. But rather than allow death to claim him naturally, he began seeking ways to artificially extend his life. We never find out exactly what he was trying to do, because word got around that people were disappearing, and everyone knew it was the work of Octopot's touch of death. This touch of death is apparently also what created Senmet, so we can assume some form of dark sorceries. It looks like Octopot was purposefully trying to turn himself into a mummy, but I couldn't find a blatant confirmation of that anywhere. He might have instead been trying to usurp Ra as a deity, it's, it's unclear. But one of the pharaoh's closest aides, a priest known as the Hierophant, refused to let Harakir be corrupted. So he snuck into Ankhtapat's chambers and slew him in the night. But Ankh's plans were too far along. They simply managed to put the pharaoh into a fitful and eternal sleep. Since then, the desert has twisted and warped with the vengeful mummy's rotten dreams. The storms, the plague, the monsters. Harakir is Ankhtapat's nightmare. Having learned all this, and gaining a few goodies along the way, we're done with the Sphinx. Now, one of the things we found during our dungeon diving was a magic loot, and we use it to trigger a surprisingly charming cutscene. We track down an elusive ghost in the desert, who disappears every time we try and talk to her. But this time, we don't talk to her. We play it cool, you know what I mean? A little eye contact across the room to get her interested, and then we pull out the secret weapon. We start playing the guitar. See, now she wants to talk to us. Works every time. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. Where souls, where dreams the sands to keep Our dead speak of my breathless son Routed in dark and endless sleep In boats lost near the rising sun Yet brought light, one heart denied Our fear of will grown grim and cold Thief of life, he tried to steal Endless life from the gods hold Taking my son in darkness lies In both lost near the rising sun Low beneath the giant side Taking's music forever done Age after age the statue stands On moving bounds as with shame There above our restless Of all the things I expected in this game, I didn't expect a charming little song. I've been waiting until now to talk about the voice acting. In my Strahd's Possession video, I mentioned that it was along the more competent end of Amateur, which made it pretty great for the time. Well, in Stone Prophet, they're even better. This ghost is certainly the highlight, but there's no shortage of good and fun performances to be found. Humans must make human noises, not speak with the voice of the people. Oh, kitten, say you. No kitten am I, but Shafar of the people. This is A++ 90s voice acting. Anyway, our ghostly friend points us to her son, who has been turned into a statue. And because she already told us what we need to do to the statue, my whole support group, we're feeling a little smug. We're confident. We're hot. And we know it. So we say the name, like we're supposed to. And it does not work. I got very stuck here, and I needed to pull out the clue book. Apparently, I'd found a chain in some random tomb at some point, and I needed to give it to the statue. You know what? People don't watch this channel because I'm some kind of genius problem solver, okay? I rush back to my supply tent, and this time we get into the burial hall. And listen, it's a blur. 
Do you have any idea how many pixelated tombs I've raided in a row? This mosaic here is the guardian of the gate, and she judges my morality to see if I'm worthy. And apparently, I am. She allows me to speak to one of those dead adventurers who were previously in Gloriantha's group. Apparently, he survived the battle with Senmet, and was able to find a scroll of return. Unfortunately, he was chased into the Wall of Ra, and died before he could use it. Which means that the only way home is currently behind a scorching wall of death. And uh, that's gonna be a problem, but on the other hand, at least now we know where it is. Okay, Temple of Ra, second last tomb. We're almost done. I am so ready to find and assemble the last pieces of these seals. And it works, it goes very well. But then, as seems to be tradition as I am approaching the end of these games, my god damned save file corrupts and I have to reload three hours earlier. I'm tired. I'm seeing scarabs on the walls. I, I see my cat and I think she's an ancient Egypt reference. I take a deep breath. I turn on my favorite audiobook and I grind through these areas that I have to replay. Holy fuck is this wrong! But holy hell is it demonic! So true, Gilbert. In time, I arrive at the end of this dungeon, for the second time, and I find a curious sight. The hero font who had previously killed Senmet is actually still alive but he's turned himself into another greater mummy to oppose Octopot. Luckily for me, he's frozen in place and sleeping. We assemble the first of the two seals, the Hierophant seal, and we thunk it into the wall next to him. A portal opens, a portal which we cannot enter, which makes it I, I think that makes it not a portal, it just makes it a glowing wall. Nevertheless, it is time to end the pharaonic power nap that has plagued Harakir for millennia. On to the final tomb, on to Pharaoh's rest. The final dungeon is the sort where we're running up and down between floors in order to progress further through the tomb. On the lower level, we once again meet the priestess Isu, who surprisingly doesn't attack us. Though, I mean, she's certainly mad that we killed Zenmet. But again, I mean, again, she's not angry enough to actually attack me. She doesn't need to, she says. Because apparently, the hero font is stuck in the Temple of Ra, and his plan was to steal the greater mummy Senmet and combine his own power with Senmet's mobility as a ploy to kill Octopot. Which means, she cackles, that we foiled the hero font's plan that he has been scheming for thousands of years. So she actually doesn't need to kill us, because the hero font is gonna fuck us up for destroying the only anti pharaoh weapon in Harakir. Okay, shit, um, I probably shouldn't have killed that fucking mummy, huh? Still, nowhere left to go but forward. I don't have a plan, but at least I've got momentum, you know? I continue, and eventually we collect the final seal fragment. I combine it together and slot it into the wall. A portal opens, which I presume will lead me directly into the claws of a furious hero font. I do not go through, because I enjoy living. Cool, 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 we'll tip the doorman, and we have arrived at Onctopot. Here we go. Just you and me, buddy. Me and an ancient tyrant, ready to duke it out man to man and- Oh my god, I should not have killed that fucking mummy, fuck! Okay, okay, alright, alright, new plan, new plan. I read the stone prophet one more time, and this time, I actually use my brain. Two seals each in four pieces lie. Piece to piece, the seals rejoined. Two gates are opened. Into conflict, the foes are led. Onctopot and the other. Okay, okay, this is fine. Everything is fine. The OG plan was for the hero font to possess Senmet and head over to Onctopot. But that, I mean, that's no longer an option. 
What if we instead send the pharaoh to the hero font? Kiting Ankhtapot down the hallways was a nightmare. Stand too close and Ankh will one-shot your entire party. Stand too far and he stops following. Plus, I'm not looking where I'm going and I keep stepping on traps. But eventually, we get there and the battle of the 10,000 year old soccer mummies begins. But I mean in slow motion for some reason because I don't know man, they're old. We escape the temple as it collapses behind us. We have done it. A quick check reveals that the wall of Ra has indeed falled just as feels that the wall of Ra has indeed falled just as the stone has indeed falled. Indeed falled. Why would it be falled, you stupid mother? A quick check reveals that the wall of Ra has indeed fallen, just as the stone prophet promised. The scroll of returning is retrieved, and I open a portal back to Elturel. The villagers of Muhar all show up and send a small child to apologize because they're too embarrassed to do it themselves. What the f why would I forgive you if you sent a child to do this? We return back to Elturel and we're given a warm welcome. I like to imagine that the whole city was transported to Avernus the very next day. Well, that was Stone Prophet. And by extension, that was the Ravenloft series. We'll absolutely check out the spin-off sometime after Christmas. But for now, I gotta work on some smaller projects to get my channel tempo back up a bit. We'll be back very soon to cover the final Ravenloft game, which is unconnected to the other two. And if you haven't already, it would mean the world to me if you were willing to donate on Patreon. I've got a few perks already at the moment, notably a printable set of rules and game assets for an 800 year old role playing game that was played and invented in Norman, England. I made a video about it a million years ago when I was a different kind of YouTuber. I'll do a rework of my perks sometime after Christmas for the new content, but for now, just let it be known that I really do appreciate everything you guys do to support me. See you soon, everybody.